tucked away in the central west end of St. Louis is an architectural and cultural gem. The building was the artistic home of one of the most influential playwrights that the country has produced. And the story of their relationship needs to be told. The story begins with the building itself. The Wednesday Club building at 4504 Westminster Place in the St. Louis Central West End was designed by the prominent architect Theodore Link. Link also designed Union Station and the International Shoe Company building in downtown St. Louis and the Mississippi State Capitol building in Jackson. In the Central West End area, he also designed the formidable gates at the entrance to Westmoreland Place near Forest Park and the Second Presbyterian Church directly across the street from the Wednesday Club building. The Wednesday Club building now goes under the name Link Auditorium. Few people realize that the building nurtured the career of a young man who came to be known as Tennessee Williams, perhaps America's foremost playwright. The handsomely designed prairie-style building features a broad stairway leading up to the entrance on Westminster Place. A small foyer offers gathering space before entering a spacious, fan-shaped, 500-seat auditorium. The auditorium is raked so that all seats have a good view of the stage. The green leatherette theater seats are contoured for comfort. Large windows line each wall, lending the room an airy feeling in the daylight hours and with blinds to shut out light when necessary. The auditorium has good acoustics so that an actor can be heard in the back row without amplification. Though it has been in continuous use, the Link Auditorium has not been significantly altered since the 1930s. Backstage light fixtures have been converted from gas to safer electric forms. Old scenic flats covered in sturdy canvas line the walls of the stage. Offstage is a dimmer system comprised of open levers to control the brightness of stage lights. There are small dressing rooms with makeup mirrors that can accommodate six to eight performers. There's a crossover hallway connecting the dressing rooms and the stage. A trap door allows access into an unfinished cellar below the stage. A backstage stairway provides access to the second floor. The second floor is dominated by a large dining room with a sturdy beamed ceiling. Along one side of the dining room is a well-appointed kitchen Along the other side of the dining room are smaller sitting rooms. The Wednesday Club was established in 1867 in private homes as a women's social and cultural organization. It adopted the name Wednesday Club in 1890 to reflect their weekly meeting practice. Beginning in 1896, the club met at the YMCA at Franklin and Grand, but moved into their prairie-style building in 1908 where they remained until moving to the newer western suburbs in 1971. The Wednesday Club attracted prominent women, but the focus was serious and intellectual. The building was designed for lectures, readings, dramatic and musical events in the auditorium, with the upstairs dining rooms for relaxed socializing. The Wednesday Club building was situated on the corner of Taylor Avenue and Westminster Place, only a block and a half from the apartments at 4633 Westminster Place in which the Williams family lived when they first moved to St. Louis. Just around the corner from the Wednesday Club building on Olive Street was the Eugene Field Elementary School where Tom Williams was bullied by children on the playground. Also on Olive Street is the indoor swimming pool, the Lorelei, where Williams went to swim. So in 1936, when Tom Williams received a poetry prize from the ladies of the Wednesday Club, he must have felt right at home. His mother, Edwina, was there for the award, though she never attained membership. Williams described the occasion thus, No stage, no speech, just a room full of tired, elegant old ladies, a couple of priests and some very young poets. It was just the beginning of Williams' experience in that building. The Wednesday Club hosted an amateur theater group called the Mummers of St. Louis who produced their seasons there from 1933 until 1938. Thomas Lanier Williams, the homegrown playwright who later became Tennessee, saw three of his plays staged by the Mummers on the stage of the Wednesday Club Auditorium. The director of the Mummers, Willard Holland, asked Williams to write a short curtain raiser for the Armistice Day production of Bury the Dead, an anti-war play by Irwin Shaw. 
Williams weighed in with a 30-minute political sketch entitled Headlines that was followed by a 12-minute intermission, then the 60-minute Irwin Shaw play sponsored by the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union. Within a few months after Headlines, the Mummers staged Williams' play Candles to the Sun. Situated in the coal mining country of Alabama, Candles to the Sun is set in two rustic cabins. The playwright's description of the closing moments of its romantic scene four indicates his sense of how lighting, sound, staging, etc. come together to make theatrical moments. The door is drawn slowly open, admitting a bar of moonlight. They go out. Then it is drawn slowly closed. Music comes again more distinctly as though carried up by the wind. Then it fades almost into silence. After a moment, Luke's voice is heard calling. Star! Star! The door is pushed open. He calls her again. He sees she is gone. Then he goes off down the road, still calling her name. The fiddles continue playing until curtain. The play was a hit with the St. Louis reviewers in March of 1937. Quote, Williams, 25-year-old Washington University senior, is revealed not only as a writer of unusual promise, but one of considerable technical skill right now, unquote. After success with Candles to the Sun, the next new play was called Fugitive Kind, set in a flop house on the St. Louis waterfront, depicting an ensemble of transients who passed through its doors. In Fugitive Kind, Williams describes the scene in specific detail. The lobby of a flop house in a large Middle Western city. A large glass window admits a skyline of the city whose towers are outlined at night by a faint electric glow, so that we are always conscious of the city as a great, implacable force, pressing in upon the shabby room and crowding its fugitive inhabitants back against their wall. Leo from Fugitive Kind watches through the window on a snowy New Year's Eve. The snow's beautiful at night. It gives you an illusion of escape. Those buildings aren't there anymore. You can't see the Union light and power. The Cosmopolitan Trust has disappeared. The Western Pacific's been blotted out by snow. Tonight's God's night of sleep, I suppose. He's tired of looking at the nasty mess we've made of ourselves. He's pulled down a big white shade to cover us up. After Fugitive Kind, Williams continued to correspond with Willard Holland about producing other new plays. But by the end of 1938, Williams was on his way to New Orleans, Holland went to Hollywood, and the Mummers of St. Louis was disintegrating as a coherent group. Although the Wednesday Club, or Link Auditorium, was not a fully equipped professional theater, neither was it an improvised, lap-together space. It had a well-appointed stage with a fair degree of lighting control. Even when the Mummers didn't live up to his wishes, it's worth noting that young Tennessee Williams believed that whatever he imagined might have been accomplished. The Link Auditorium encouraged Williams' imagination to fly free and it set him on a path to become the author of plays like A Streetcar Named Desire, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, The Night of the Iguana, and most appropriately, The Glass Menagerie, a play that was set in the author's memory of a flat just down the street from 4504 Westminster Place. The Link Auditorium, home of the Wednesday Club and of the Mummers of St. Louis, an important part of the literary and dramatic history of the St. Louis West End. <laughs>